Hey listeners, welcome to another episode of Brown Girl Street podcast. This is your host Aman Tiwana and this is Kathy Thakur and both of us love reading books. On this podcast we bring our favorite books to you and discuss the parts that were most meaningful to us and how we found them interesting or relatable as brown girls. Today we are discussing a self-help book called Learn Optimism by Martin Seligman which has had a successful run for over 15 years now. Martin Seligman is a pioneer in the field of positive psychology and the author of Authentic Happiness and The Optimistic Child. In his book The Learned Optimism, he draws on more than 20 years of clinical research to demonstrate how optimism enhances the quality of life and how anyone can learn to practice it. The book starts with his research findings about helplessness in people and moves on to explaining how cognitive behavioral therapy can help break up depression boost your immune system better develop your potential and make you happier learned optimism is both profound and practical and valuable for every phase of life we also have a bonus for you in this episode some pearls of wisdom from a humble jellyfish which is a self care book written by a brown girl rani sha let's hear a quick word from our sponsor before continuing with our discussion If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. In the intro of the book it's mentioned how antidepressants are not a solution to depression but learned skills are I love that I mean yes there are cases where medicine is required and is super helpful but we cannot undermine the value of the learned skills that Seligman talks about in this book The book says that there are three forces that have now converged and that has caused this epidemic of depression in young people First is that depression is a disorder of the eye failing in your eyes relative to your goals which is so true i know second is that faith in god community nation and the large extended family has all eroded in the last 40 years the third one is a focus on the self esteem curriculum in schools that are taught to kids their research has shown that people who have high self esteem will also have a mean streak in them when these children confront the real world and it tells them they are not as great as they have been taught they will lash out in violence i can see that and i also see that we are definitely going away from a community based living especially here in the us in india there is still a stronger community which of course comes with its own cons for sure but it can definitely help you stay afloat when you have people to rely on Yeah I agree that's why I think I don't even feel like living in the US anymore <laughs> This is all great like awesome job opportunities great work culture but there is no sense of community even when you work hard and form a community around you the sense of having the kind of people around you that you have in India is not effortless and every time I visit India and all of my family is together I'm just thinking that the US has everything but you know it doesn't have this thing where you're constantly around people who really love you or maybe just they are stuck with you for life. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. It's definitely not the same. And you're right. There is a lot more effort involved in maintaining social circles here. Like so much planning and logistics. Sometimes it feels like a headache. Whereas in India I remember that being so much more organic probably because our roots are much deeper over there. and i also think that us living is more suited to people who have individualistic tendencies someone like me i guess hashtag #introvert life <laughs> yeah i realized when i moved to the us that i'm not an introvert <laughs> i was an extrovert this whole time <laughs> you know the thing you said about self esteem i think that also rings very true i don't think we were fed this idea so much growing up that we are the best at everything no matter what we do but i'm sure if we were it will take away the need for us to learn or improve ever right which in its own can be catastrophic once you step into the real world or step out of your sheltered household 
Yeah, I just can't imagine a world where I'm super confident and have high self-esteem growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in brown households, a chappal will fly at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, okay, I suck. <laughs> yeah. Back to reality. Speaking of reality, he mentions the definition of pessimistic and optimistic thinking and how it can affect your reality. And he has defined pessimists as people who tend to believe bad events will last a long time, will undermine everything they do and are their own fault. While optimists are the people who believe defeat is just a temporary setback and it's not their fault. They are unfazed by defeat. I love these definitions, you know, it clearly gives you an understanding of a pessimist person and an optimist person. Going by these definitions, what do you think you are? Are you an optimist or a pessimist? I think I'm more of a pessimist by definition. I know Seligman does say that optimistic thinking doesn't mean inflating your ego or something, but even then I feel like I always struggle with being too optimistic because there is some sort of reality check in place all the time. Like if I practice telling myself that I'm amazing at my job, that check immediately follows that no you are not, you messed up that part. So <laughs> yeah, I think I have pessimistic, realistic inclinations. Simply said, I think I'm just too self-critical. Yeah, it's difficult to be optimistic all the time. What works for me is to catch a negative thought and turn it into a positive thought. You know, if on social media I see someone who's doing better than me in life in general, of course you all get negative thoughts like, you know, look at this person who's doing so many things and look at me, I'm just here working randomly on things. And then instead of how I used to get sad earlier, I just think to myself that if I work hard enough and be patient, I can reach there. See now that sounds more realistic to me. Yes, I'm definitely not optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm even a realist, you know. I have been pessimistic my whole life. I, of course I'm trying to change that now. I think to succeed in life it's kind of important to be a die hard optimist. Well, we are two peas in a pod khati because I'm also <laughs> practicing optimism in my life. Merely because it always feels better to feel good about yourself, right? Right. While we are discussing learned optimism, I also want to talk about this book, Wisdom from a Humble Jellyfish, written by Rani Shah, which also touches on the same concept of learned optimism in one of its chapters. So, in her book, Rani has taken several lessons from nature, both flora and fauna, lessons that can help us take better care of ourselves. In one of the chapters, which is about sunflowers, Rani talks about the power of optimism, that how by looking on the bright side of things, we can increase our lifespan improve our relationships, and have overall healthier lives. And she also mentions two very simple exercises to put this into practice. So the first one is practicing gratitude, which you can do by writing a letter to your friends and family and maybe read it out loud to them. Apparently, it can boost your mood for four weeks. That's a lot of positivity, right? Yeah. And the second tip she mentions is writing three good things at the end of the day about your day. and i can definitely vouch for this one it makes you feel so much better about your life sometimes when i'm not feeling so great by the end of the day i just think about the things that really made me happy that day right even it could be the shortest thing like having a cookie after your lunch and even if that is the only good thing in your day right it just makes you feel great just yeah it's very easy to forget the good things that happen so i think practices like these can help us be more positive in general Right and these are very practical exercises and easy to implement in your daily life. I totally love it. Today's episode is presented by Wear. Wear was founded with the goal of building an affordable everyday wristwatch that blends tasteful design with extreme durability and functionality. Wear returns a sense of dignity to affordable wristwatches and are built to last. Wear is a true American watch company specializing in both quartz and automatic watches. Wear is offering our listeners 15% off if you use the code PODGO15. Go to wearwatches.com to learn more and get your new timepiece today. Riverdale High AV Podcast is a sibling hosted comedy podcast which gets into the history of Archie Comics through the years along the way. But this show can be enjoyed even if you aren't familiar with Archie or Riverdale. Their side series called RHS Public Access covers different Archie titles in popular media. 
they will also be starting the chilling adventures of sabrina season 1 in october you can find them on apple spotify stitcher google or any other podcast app their website is riverdalehighav.club and follow them on social media at riverdalehighav we both have read books on habit formation the power of habit and atomic habits which emphasize the importance of reward in making a behavior but in this book seligman talks about learned helplessness which was very interesting to me because this is the first time i have read about this ideology i know he mentions that he did research on helplessness and he found that one third of the people became helpless when they realized that there is no way that they're getting out of a miserable situation Yeah it was very interesting to read like we have all read or heard that rewards motivate but if through life experiences someone has learned that no matter what they do things are not going to change that it just does not matter of course they will have no motivation left in life you know when i was reading this i was thinking about these people we have all seen in our lives people who seem to be done with life and they are somehow reduced to angry bitter old person stereotype in a way but i feel maybe throughout the journey of their life they have learned some sort of helplessness that's why they stopped trying yeah that's very true you know when we're talking about learned helplessness of course like you said there are so many people around us but this reminds me of a character in the office which is a show on netflix Stanley Hudson he, <laughs> I can see that <laughs> He had really just given up and I was always thinking why is he like that and you know after l- reading learned optimism and learning about learned helplessness I think I have an answer to my question <laughs> Yeah if you think about it if any of us had to work for Michael Scott in real life we would all be Stanleys for sure <laughs> Yeah I think learned helplessness applies in our daily lives as well People just talk of motivation as a solution for everything. Like if you want to lose weight, there is this thing you hear often that think of a dress you want to fit in and use it as a motivation for yourself. But if there is a person who has been trying to lose weight for years and over and over has failed, they will have a certain helplessness about it. And I don't think this dress is going to motivate them. Right. And don't even talk about losing weight. It has haunted <laughs> me my entire life. You know I've tried all sorts of motivation techniques it does not work because I have the drive to eat things right <laughs> which I <laughs> which is definitely greater than any random fleeting motivation to work out well that is the truth i think we need to replace this blanket solution of motivation which is like you know plastered on every problem and start getting a deeper understanding of learned helplessness how human behavior actually plays a role in what we do and we do not do that's actually a really good point and this book really helps you in understanding about your thought process that eventually leads to learned helplessness so when i was reading about this i started noticing what my thought pattern was if i had some sort of learned helplessness like you know sometimes i would think i can never do this difficult task this is not me or i am just stupid and this is exactly what the book mentions pessimistic people usually think in shoulds and always and nevers and start ruminating over their negative thoughts and eventually this leads to helplessness did you notice anything like that in your own thought process too yeah i also looked at my thought patterns when i was reading this part i feel i did have a lot of these in the past for sure like really permanent statements about myself which are of course super negative like i am just a failure i will never amount to anything i can never do anything right which now that i look back on are clearly so destructive and it reminds me of something that you see online like this quote never speak to yourself in a way you wouldn't talk to a friend which you know is trying to tell you to just be kind to yourself and i think that is so important because the words that we say to ourselves about ourselves they can be very pervasive to our psyche and can actually cause real damage to our mental health right if you are usually just too hard on ourselves and it takes a long time to get into this habit of speaking kindly to your inner self i have noticed learned helplessness in the thought process of people So like I was talking to a friend and she said that she doesn't know how to do taxes because she's stupid. And that made me realize that these are the things that we keep telling ourselves that will manifest negative thinking in our minds about ourselves. That's absolutely right. It's something that happens so commonly that 
especially women I've seen, they often apologize a lot for how stupid or dumb they are because they just messed up. And a lot of it has to do with conditioning as well, that you are taught that you are somehow not as good at your job. But think of it in comparison, if there's a person who's like, oh, I just messed up versus you say I'm stupid, how big of a difference that is. I know. And that just goes back to how we are so hard on ourselves all the time while talking to our inner self. And one of the solutions presented in the book to correct this is cognitive behavioral therapy. It basically changes the way a depressed patient consciously thinks about failure, defeat, loss and helplessness. But I think it's also not just about depressed people, right? I think it could be about every one of us. It changes your thought process on how you think about yourself or how you talk to yourself. I think I saw it as a workout for your brain, how to challenge your own thoughts and, you know, get stronger at selecting your thoughts in a way. Yeah. Before we move on, Kathy, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about how this exercise works? Yes, I'm so excited to talk about this because I think (laughs) this has helped me so much since I read this book. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is all about ABCDE, which is an acronym. A stands for adversity. B is for beliefs. Then consequences. D is for disputation. And E is for energization. When we encounter an adversity, we react by thinking about it, right? And then slowly our thoughts solidify into beliefs. And these beliefs, which are usually negative, become so habitual, we don't even realize we have these beliefs. And then this belief system that has now become a habit, it definitely has consequences for us. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps us in disputing these negative thoughts and beliefs by identifying them and countering them with a positive thought. And E, which is energization, is the outcome that comes out of this exercise, basically, which is your new positive thought. And I think this is a great method to keep our thoughts in check. And I love that in the book, he also provided some sample worksheets to practice and, you know, check your thought patterns, which I think can be super helpful. On that note, did you actually try any of these exercises, Kathy? Yes, I did. I was so impressed by CBT. So I got a CBT handbook, which is called the Feeling Good Handbook by David Burns. And I have been working on it ever since. I do it just for like 15 minutes every day, one page of the handbook. And I think as a result of that, I'm now seeing myself being able to identify my pessimistic thought process. I think I have noticed that, you know, when I'm feeling low someday, my thoughts will eventually become negative, right? Self-doubt, And sometimes, you know, you start thinking that, okay, I'm never going to get this. I'm never going to be where I want to be because I'm stupid. But now my brain has started, you know, stopping me on that thought process. And it's like, no, you can do everything. This is not just a good moment that you're in right now, but this will go away. So you can see, you know, how my positive thought process is disputing my negative thinking. That's awesome. I know. I mean, it's not magic. I have worked hard towards it, but (laughs) it feels like magic now. (laughs) And the great part is that these exercises in the handbook are super fun too. And I think that's what I like about CBT. It's like a self-help alternative to therapy. I agree. I also have tried these exercises, I think, a few years ago. And that's when I stumbled upon Feeling Good book, which is the same one that you have the handbook of. And I definitely see value in those exercises. But like any other exercise, you have to keep doing them over and over to get any kind of results. Now it's time for brownie points. But before that, let's give a shout out to our listener who left us a great review on Apple Podcasts. So our listener of the day is Social Being. And they write that, I like the way this podcast addresses some very important topics and the way they provide their real life perspective. It has definitely made me rethink some of the norms we are all accustomed to. Really highlights how social conditioning plays a role in all of our lives and inspires me to bring change. Would definitely recommend to my friends. Thank you, social being. Love it. Thank you, social being. All right, now, the first brownie point. I really like that the book gives you a pause to stop and look at your thinking patterns, along with the assurance that with learned skills, we can shift the thought patterns that affect our mental health. Yeah, you're right. Although I feel like this could turn out to be a long read for some people, especially because he has outlined and explained a lot of research findings, although it's in an explanatory way, but I still feel like the examples that he has given 
go into too much detail and honestly i got bored at some point in this book it seemed repetitive until you know you eventually go to the cbt part and then it starts to get a little bit interesting i think that's a problem with a lot of research based books there's like so much in them and you do get bored at one point yeah. but even then i will give this book another brownie point which is for how it makes you think about your own role in your mental health and encourages you to take responsibility and i feel that this is the first step in getting any help that you need recognizing that there's a problem and then acting on it on your own right i'll also give one brownie point to this book because the tips mentioned in the book about becoming optimistic is not from the point of view of someone becoming more selfish or self assertive it is basically to learn a new set of skills about how to talk yourself when you suffer a personal defeat there is something that i didn't like about this book which is too much oversimplification like you are a pessimist therefore you are depressed and that language was very questionable to me and i know that all authors do this they already have a message they want to get out and all their research is cherry picked to confirm that there's hardly ever a holistic picture of things but i really wish there was one book that existed with plain facts and no bias towards the title of the book or you know author's background i'm also questioning the ability of cbt to cure like clinically depressed people maybe with the help of a therapist you could do that self help cbt is important for people who are pessimists and want to help themselves to improve their thought process i think oh for sure i don't think this is a solution for every case either like there are cases where medication is more than necessary and that's where i feel this kind of one track knowledge can be harmful sometimes yeah so this was a discussion on the book learned optimism by martin seligman This book gives you great insights into the human thought process and enables you to challenge the negativity. Although this could be a long read for some, but you will definitely get a lot of value out of it. And in the end, we also want to give Wisdom from a Humble Jellyfish a shout out for how creatively it uses nature as a way to impart important knowledge about mental health and self-care in a very simplified manner. I actually really love the illustrations in the humble jellyfish and it's so colorful and crafty. I know it's such a cute book and the artist that who has done the illustrations Gemma Coral have actually been following her for years and I love her work. Thank you Rani for sending us the book. We really enjoyed reading it. Yeah, thanks a lot Rani and we look forward to seeing your future work. Thank you for listening to this episode of Brown Girls Read podcast. If you like what you hear, please leave us a 5 star rating and a comment. You can support us at anchor.fm/browngirlsread/support. Your support will allow us to continue this podcast and bring more episodes to you. Also, don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Instagram @browngirlsreadpod. And if you have book recommendations for us, you can leave us a comment or message on Instagram. For our next episode we are reading a memoir of friendship called Big Friendship by Amina Tao and Anne. We hope you'll be reading with us and until then keep listening. Keep listening.